Okay, I'm gonna start this video off with like a really dumb joke. Why would you want to learn assembly? Because then all the code in the world is open source. So, before we can actually get into writing assembly code, uh, we need to understand a little bit about the CPU first, because it's pretty essential um, for understanding how assembly works and how to write good assembly code. So I'm just going to quickly cover some of the basics of CPU architect architecture, so that when you're writing assembly code, you can um, like understand what what's happening, un like what underlying processes are taking place, and how your code's actually running, because it's pretty important when writing assembly. Okay. So your code initially starts off in your hard drive. So um, you wrote the code and then you compiled it and then maybe maybe it exists somewhere in your hard drive. Like these bytes are allocated for your executable, right? Um, and then what, what essentially happens is you load that executable into the RAM. All right, RAM is a random access memory. It's basically uh, the way you can think about it is where the computer stores values it's like working on, right? So. A hard drive is like static storage. They, it doesn't like the computer doesn't read and write to it too much, right? But the RAM is where the computer stores values that it's like kind of dealing with uh, at that present moment. So it wants to keep it somewhere where it can remember it. Um, and essentially, uh, what happens is when, once the program is uh, loaded in, it's initial. Um, uh, these things in the CPU called registers are initialized now. Registers are like mini storages inside the CPU. Um, the x86 architecture has 16 of them, uh, and most of them are just like free for you to use however you want. Uh, but a few of them have specific roles, uh, like specific like things that they conventionally do. And we'll get into how to use those registers to do what they're meant to do uh, once we start writing some assembly code, which should be soon. Uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, but for now, just note that uh, the computer, like the CPU, can um, execute these instructions in code. Uh, it can allocate space on um, in the RAM, and it can also allocate space in the registers, or like use the registers, if you will. So uh, the first thing the computer does is it puts this uh, this one register inside your uh, CPU called RIP, which is the register instruction pointer. So the instruction pointer and it points it to the start of your code. And then it just sequentially runs every line of code and moves the instruction pointer down. That's how it keeps track of it. Um, some other registers that have specific meanings are R, BP, and RSP, which are the base pointer and the stack pointer. But we'll, I'll get into that in a later video when I cover um, calling functions and allocating to the stack. But other than that, I think most registers are uh, you're pretty much free to use them how you want and I think some of these concepts will make more sense once we actually start looking at some assembly code. Okay, so when um, when you're working with assembly, uh, one of I think the best ways to learn learn how to code it uh, is surprisingly just to, like to work through some programs and pretend you're the computer like executing it so you can understand what the computer is doing. Uh, because the the, um, the language itself is very simple, but that simplicity leads to some pretty intricate design patterns and some pretty complicated uh, like design, uh, like design best practices that you need to learn how to follow. So it's always a good idea in my opinion to just like go through the code to make sure you understand those because the syntax itself isn't the tricky part of assembly. It's understanding what's actually happening and why like we're doing the things that are conventional. So I'll, I'll just get started. Uh, the first line just says global underscore main. Now this line doesn't actually get given to the executable. This line is just for like our linker so that our linker understands that once this function, once the assembly code is compiled into uh, an object file, which is essentially just all of the instructions get translated into like their, uh, like the machine versions of it, because machines don't read uh, it as move, they read it as like a sequence of numbers, right? Um, this global main uh, just indicates that this main function here uh, is a global function, which means it can be called from other executables, right? So that's it. 
Um, and then we have this line section text. That's basically saying, okay, I'm gonna start the section, uh, I'm gonna start the text section from here on out. And the text section is basically just the place where you put your code. Uh, not sure why it's called text. I think that's for uh, like historical reasons because before like they used to like read like the text like the computer used to read the text, but I'm not too sure about that. Right, so then we have um, underscore main. And this is how we declare functions in assembly because the thing is, there's not really any concept of functions. Um, the way functions were implemented in assembly is through the use of like some registers, like the instruction pointer register and the base pointer and the stack pointer. And other than that, like there's no like defined way of implementing functions, but this is the way libc does it. So it's generally a good idea to um, like use the libc standard for implementing functions because then you can call uh, libc functions from inside your code, which is gonna come in handy later. But uh, this is just pure assembly code without any libc, so we're just gonna move. So this is the first instruction, I guess, uh, you guys are gonna hear about. It's move, it's pretty self-explanatory. Just moves this value into this. So the way you can interpret it, interpret this command is that rax is equal to this value. It's equal to zero, two million, four, right? Now, um, these instructions are just moving a few values into certain registers. So these are the register things I was talking about at the start of the video. Uh, but in order to understand why we're doing this, I'm gonna have to explain this instruction first. This instruction is uh, known as syscall. And what syscall does is um, sort of complicated, but I'll try my best to explain it. Syscall is essentially an instruction which tells like your operating system that you want to do something like special because like when you're working in assembly code you can you can do quite a bit you can write to ram you can move values around you can do computation right all of that is allowed but suppose you want to go write to a file or suppose you want to go terminate a program or suppose you even want to start another program you need to go like you're not allowed to do that directly from assembly code because uh, programs, I guess, uh, in user space or like programs like the user will mess around with, like the user can write and the user can use. Um, they're not really meant to be able to like go write, write files directly because you're not sure if you give um, programs that much power, like they could go and like pretty much delete your whole file system if they wanted. So the solution to this that um, the people who were like writing uh, operating systems came up with is something called system calls. Basically, what you do is you say, okay, I am going to put these values in these registers and they're gonna tell you what to do. And then I'll just uh, use this instruction syscall. And basically what this does is it goes and talks to the operating system and says, hey, these are the values I have. Can you do this thing for me? Like, um, and in this case, we're trying to write hello world to standard out. So I'll explain a bit more about the parameters in a bit. But what then happens is when you when you write syscall and uh, the operating system processes these values, it'll move your instruction pointer to like a special part of the code, which you're not allowed to usually reach. And that'll essentially let you um, print those, print the value um, to where, like write the value to what, whatever you want. In this case, it's standard out, uh, which is like the output of the terminal. And then, uh, and then what happens is it just moves your instruction pointer right back to where you were. So right to the instruction after syscall, that way you're only allowed to use the special mode for exactly what you requested. So you can't like um, then go ahead and like start to mess around with your the computer. So that's a safety, that's there for like safety sake to make sure like no malicious programs able to like destroy a computer. Um, so in order to do this, we need to use this kind of convoluted way of writing to the file. So I'm gonna start explaining these instructions a bit because currently this probably looks like gibberish. Uh, the first thing we're moving um, the, this value like uh, 20 million and four. Is it 20? Yeah, 20 million and four to Rx, but it's actually not 20 million and four because it's in hexadecimal. Um, but basically all this is, is this is the code for write, the write instruction, right? Um, all syscalls and max are uh, like basically uh, 20 million plus like the syscall number. Right, in 20 million, but in decimal, but like in hex, in hexadecimal form. 
and we move it to the register RAX because that's where the syscall instruction looks to understand like what system call you want to do. And then we're moving the rest of the parameters um, into like different registers. So we move uh, the number one into RDI because the file descriptor or like the, the location, I guess, the virtual location of standard out, uh, which is like the terminal console, is um, the file descriptor number one. So we move one to RDI, then we move um, string to RSI. So if I just uh, move this paper up a bit, you'll see string here written at the bottom. And what string essentially is, is it's, it's a place in our executable. So this is one of the interesting things about assembly language. You can have data and code mixing together in, in like the same executable, right? So it's obviously in a different section. This is the section data, this is the data section. And um, here what we're doing is we're saying, okay, this is gonna be like a string area. And we're using this uh, thing DB, we're using this command DB. Now DB is actually not a command that's directly inside x86-64. It's actually a command given to us by NASA, right? which is the assembler we're using. And the reason why we want to, um, the reason why we're using DB is because it allows us to write bytes, like just play and write bytes here. So um, in the executable at this location, there will be the bytes for hello world, like written there. And uh, that's pretty useful because whenever we want to write data, right, we, we need to like specify like, okay, I just want to write these bytes so we can use the DB command to make this pretty easy for us. All right. And then we're also specifying this dot len thing which um, uh, again, this is another NASM command, EQ, uh, dollar sign minus string. The dollar sign just means the location of len and string, uh, well, I already said what it is. It's the location of, uh, it's where the bytes hello world start. So if you actually uh, look at it, basically what it's saying is that, okay, uh, calculate the, the relative position of this command, like of len, right, which is, like relative to the start of the executable, uh, give me the position of len and then subtract it by the position of string. And um, basically string will start here, len will be literally the character after D. So when you subtract it, you basically get the length of hello world. And that's pretty important because the right the right command uh, takes three parameters. It takes one, um, the, it'll takes uh, the file descriptor, it'll take like a char, a, a char star or char pointer to like a buffer where the string is located, which in this case is within our executable. And it'll also take the length of the string. Because unlike in C, in assembly, you don't really need to have like null terminated strings. So like this works perfectly fine, right? And then we, we call syscall and uh, as I explained before, that just basically goes, tells the kernel, okay, just look at these parameters and do your thing. Then after that, uh, we have like the next, uh, I guess, chunk of the code, right? And this is to exit the program. So uh, we're moving, um, we're moving, um, I guess, the syscall number one or uh, tw uh, 20 million and one into RAX, right? And this is the code for exit, right? And then there's another new instruction that you guys won't have seen before. It's called XOR. We're going XOR RDI RDI. Now, XOR uh, stands for exclusive OR, and it basically performs a uh, bitwise exclusive OR. Now, for those of you that know what exclusive OR is, that uh, exclusive OR basically means that if the two values are the same, uh, it'll return a zero, and if the two values are different, it'll return a one. And basically, what happens is if you XOR two values that are the same, all the bits um, in the return value become zero. So when you XOR RDI with itself, um, you just essentially move zero into RDI. Um, and like, this is actually pretty common. This is something you'll see pretty commonly um, in most assembly programs, because um, the thing is the move instruction takes a few more bytes and is a, a little bit slower than the XOR instruction. So that's why, um, especially in performance critical code, which this definitely isn't, but um, a lot of times that's where you're gonna be seeing assembler used in like super high performance code. Um, you'll see like XOR being used instead of move uh, RDI zero because it's uh, it, it does make a difference what, like especially if this code is going to be called a lot. And then syscall just to finish this off. And what that essentially does is it exits with a zero uh, with with a return value of zero. So like you know how 
in um, like C code. When you, when you have your main function, you can like return a value after that. And that's basically what, what we're doing here. Now, Now what I'm gonna do really quickly is I'm just gonna go and run this code on the computer to show you what the process of compiling assembly code actually looks like and uh, what, what we can understand like from, like what we can see when the code is actually executing on the computer. Yeah, I wanna quickly show you guys how to actually compile uh, the assembly code that we've been working on so far. Uh, Cause otherwise that would be pretty useless if you couldn't compile it. So I um, here's the code, I just quickly wrote it out. Um, on a text file here, it's called hello.asm. And uh, to actually compile the code, I'm, we're gonna be using two uh, tools. The first one is NASM, which is the NetWide Assembler. And the second one is LD, which is the built-in ligand code that comes with Xcode and macOS. Uh, I have a link in the video description about how to install um, both of these things in case you need it. So, uh, the first thing we need to do in, when we're trying to compile this assembly code is create what's called an object file. So an object file is essentially um, where you take all of this human readable instructions and convert it to like the hexadecimal representation, but it's still not executable. So the way you do that is you just call NASM on the file and we just need to add this flag um, dash f uh, with macho64 just to specify what operating system we're doing it for. So Mac OS and a 64-bit version. So this produces the file called hello.o. And I just quickly want to show you guys what's inside this file, because it's pretty interesting. Um, this file basically contains the hexadecimal representation of like all of like the bytes, right? So you can actually see some of the stuff from the code here, like the the different sections here's the text section here's the data section you can also go see um, this hello world string which i'm assuming is this so uh, that's actually the thing about assembly one of the interesting things about assembly you have to literally control like the bytes in your executable so when we say db we're literally writing <laughs> bytes in the executable which i think is pretty cool and i actually if you check out this zero c here that uh, 0c is basically 12 in hexadecimal and that corresponds to um this dot len label here so when, when i guess this is evaluated by nasm it comes out to 12 uh, which is actually the length of hello world so that makes sense and then we just get a, a 12 written error executable here so that's pretty cool um but this uh, object file that we just created still isn't really executable because it's not in the correct format for our computer run, it, for our computer to run it. So we need one more step in between. We need to link this with this. We need to link this into an executable format, right? And the way we do this is we use LD. Uh, again, this other flag dash L system. Uh, it's required because it kind of links in some of the system libraries into our code, and that's what allows us to like call. Uh, a main function, right? Because usually uh, the code doesn't start with a main function. Um, it starts, actually I'm not too sure how it starts, but it like starts uh, with like a, a more lower level version of that, right? Because there's like some background code that happens before actually the main function. But because we're linking with the system libraries, we can essentially just say, here's a main function, uh, the linker, you go create all of the other code and it, it does that. And right now it should produce an executable, yeah, a.out. And if we run this, it just prints out hello world. So yeah, that's uh, that's how you compile this program uh, into an executable and run it. But, okay. So uh, just a little bit of like housekeeping, I guess, before I end the video. Um, this is like a new thing for me. I'm just trying to make these videos. So any feedback would be appreciated. Uh, and other than that, uh, thanks for watching.